Thank you all. Uh, thanks for the organizers to, uh, to invite me here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about these two vignettes. One um, ancient work from last year's 2000 ICML, and uh, one uh, uh, work that's underway right now. Um, both of them have uh, language as an aspect to them, which I think ties them together. Okay, so the first piece of work, by the way, is from uh, a student, Junyuk U, uh, O, who's just joined um, DeepMind. Okay, so this is on zero shot just generalization with multitask uh, deep reinforcement learning. So the motivation for this line of work is imagine you um, go onto Amazon.com and you order a robot and you, uh, the robot comes home in a box and you want to train it uh, so it can uh, specialize or personalize to your home and you want to um, ask it to do uh, tasks via instruction, via language instructions. The language, by the way, here will be very straightforward and simple, like things like pick up a cup, go to the bedroom, things of this sort. Okay, so the framework that we'll be using is that of multitask uh, reinforcement learning where the agent is given a task description. The task description language, if you like, uh, defines the task space. So um, there'll be some observations. The robot's going to act in the world. It's going to learn using reinforcement learning. It's going to be given a task. So the, given the task description and the observation, the agent's task is to produce an action. We'll consider two types of task descriptions, one in which the task description is a set of categorical parameters, and I'll give you examples uh, in a minute. And the other one, the more challenging one, perhaps, is that of sequential instructions. So the uh, agent has to learn how to uh, do the sequence of, uh, do the task implied by the sequence of instructions. Okay, so let's focus on the first one uh, for a minute, uh, the categorical parameters. So here we have a task that's defined by, say, the cross product of a space of parameters. For example, there might be verbs like uh, visit, pick up, transform. There might be object names like, you know, in this case, A, B, C, D, and you'll be given the, the program, the agent will be given the um, parameters, you know, one verb, one noun, and has to decide what uh, sequence of actions to do uh, depending on the observation. So, and of course, we'll be do only giving a subset of the parameterized tasks during training, and we'll be testing on uh, the generalization case. So, in this case, there's really one sharp, interesting question, other than all the reinforcement learning questions that we will address, um, which come from the fact that this is a uh, kind of a parameterized task. So, it could be that the semantics of the uh, task is sort of how, uh, in the independent of the uh, particular combinations that happen. So if I know how to pick up a box and I know how to throw a ball, then I should know how to pick up a ball because it's somehow the semantics of what you do when you do a pick up with an object is consistent. And that would be the easy case, the independent case. Okay. So the harder case would be the case where somehow the intent, the meaning of the, uh, the verb, for example, interact, would depend on the object. So the way you would interact with an apple would be different the way you would interact with, uh, say, a ball. You might throw a ball, you might eat an apple. So this is the kind of uh, interesting um, question that we'll have to address in this. Impossible, in general, to un uh, generalize over unseen combinations without some kind of prior knowledge about how uh, this kind of interaction, uh, this kind of object-dependent case could work. So um, what we're going to do is sort of insert knowledge of the sort that says, um, the way you interact with, say, chips is the way you interact with an apple, which means basically when you interact with food category objects, you, uh, you eat them. And so you want to be able to teach uh, this kind of analogy by using this kind of a, a analogy into our uh, reinforcement learning system in this case. So the way we're going to do it is we're going to learn a task embedding, and we're going to um, use analogy making to train that task embedding so that this kind of generalization happens. So we're going to use reinforcement learning to learn what a sequence of actions, the program in effect, that the agent is going to execute when given the task. We're going to use uh, classification for it to learn when it thinks the task is finished. You'll see why we need that when we do the sequential uh, instruction setting. We'll use analogy making for the task embedding case. So the reinforcement learning classification is reasonably standard here. So let me go down the analogy making route for a few minutes. The whole network will be trained end to end. The only signal that will be given uh, in terms of task completion is when, if and when it completes the task successfully, it gets a plus one, and otherwise it gets a minus one. That kind of sort of delayed uh, reinforcement task. Okay, so the, the essential idea is we'll be able to insert this kind of analogy making knowledge by uh, telling it that, look, visit A is to visit B. That relationship is the same as pick up A and pick up B, if that's indeed the case. Right, so the, the difference between these two embedding representations of pick up A and visit A and pick up B and visit B 
are the, the, the difference between the two embeddings should be the same, and that will allow us, for example, to successfully solve pickup B when only trained on pickup A, visit A, and visit B if the, if the analogy is, is, is already in the system. Sorry. Okay. And of course, similarly, visit B minus visit A should be the same as pickup B minus pickup A. So we're going to insert that kind of knowledge. So let's just do this through video. Um, so we're gonna, we built up a domain in, in Minecraft. So the Minecraft, the agent gets the first person view shown on your left. The map is how we generate an instance, which is not visible to the agent, but just showing you here for um, ease of understanding. So it has this visually restrained first person view. Uh, for in this, in, this, in this instance, the task is to, say, pick up cat. Uh, so it has to go find the cat first and then pick it up. Transform sheep, so it has to go find the sheep, pick it up and has to predict when it has done the task correctly. So the independent case is relatively easy. We look at generalization to unseen tasks. It has never been trained on transform pig or pick up horse, and it basically has a program that looks for a horse and then, uh, and then does the appropriate action, says I'm done. In the object dependent case, we're gonna have to train it to analogy making, so we basically have, um, have groups of different objects in which the interaction uh, is the same, and we give it the kind of analogy I was telling about before. So visit horses to interact with horses, the same as visit green bot and interact green bot because they're in the same category. But that's not true for sheep and green bot, which happen to be in different categories. So, um, okay, so we show that we can generalize to uh, unseen unseen tasks with the with this kind of thing. It learns to do the right sort of thing. Again, the what the agent sees is on the left-hand slide, and the, the, each map, each instance, the map is different, and has to learn how to, it, has, it learns a program to do this kind of thing. Okay, so let's see, um, in the interest of time, I know we are behind in time in this uh, workshop, so let me just keep going ahead. Okay, so next, um, I'm gonna look at a sequential instruction. So here we're gonna give a sequence of tasks like pick up three pigs, visit horse, transform three boxes, things of this sort. There'll also be a random, um, random uh, thing that can happen in the environment, some kind of magic uh, box can appear, and if that appears randomly, and if the agent happens to have seen it, it has to then interrupt whatever it's doing and go back, go and uh, take advantage of that opportunity and then go back to what it was uh, supposed to do and finish that. So there's random interruptions, handle unexpected events like that, which provide a bonus of reward. Again, the entire task is a reinforcement learning task. It only gets a reward only at the very end of doing all the sequence of interactions, of instructions. And so we construct a hierarchical reinforcement learning uh, architecture in which a meta controller, so this is how we get the compositionality we want. We have a meta controller which, reads the, which gets the instructions, literally in sort of in language form. Um, and then passes subtask, categorical subtask parameters to the parameterized skill, which is what I showed learning in the first part of this, uh, first part of this, first part of the talk. And then, um, so the metacontroller does that, it passes parameters, which then the parameterized skill executes in the given sub, executes essentially the given subtask, and then gives a termination signal when it thinks it has done to the metacontroller, which then has to move on to the next instruction and pass the right kind of thing. And of course, uh, all of this is, has to be interruptible because if the uh, observation of this sort of magic bonus box appears, then the agent has to sort of uh, halt its state, if you like, and understand, remember where it was with the previous list of instructions, go pick up that, and, uh, or take advantage of that bonus opportunity, and then pursue the, the overall task. Okay. And it has to generalize to, of course, unseen, unseen combination. So let's look at a video showing you this. So. Um, so here's a list of tasks, you know, pick up three pigs, transform three cats. Again, the first person view that the robot gets and the map that we can see. And uh, so now it has to go. By the way, there are these numbers in here as well. So now there are three things, you know, trans a verb, a, a number, a count, if you like, and an object. And, and it has to, the a meta controller has to sort of start learning how to count how many of these things it has picked up. And it has to generalize to that. We use analogy making. You know, the difference between one to three is the same as between three to five and so on. Analogy making so it can generalize to unseen numbers. Okay, so um, generalization to longer instructions. And now we were slowing down the video so you could actually see things. Now this is the real speed, or actually even this is slowed down. So here's a very long list of instructions with lots of interruptions, and it basically it's able to 
learn how to how to do all of that and the details if you like on the uh, details of the performance are are in the in the in the paper again so in the interest of time i'm going to just move on um, so in this uh, previous work we basically showed that we can get very fast generalization using reinforcement learning with analogy making to handle um, um, new inter types of interactions with objects uh, to generalize to unseen uh, long lists of instructions, even with random uh, interruption events. Okay. So now I'm going to switch to the second vignette, which is unpublished work, and I'm actually only going to present a bit of the work saving the really special thing for the paper. We'll see when it comes out. So here, um, here I'm going to look at, I guess, in, in the, the community that studies this problem, is called language emergence. So we're going to have two agents, a sort of a speaker agent and a listener agent, and there's going to be a task, and the speaker agent has to learn to communicate that task to the, to the listener agent, which then has to execute that task using reinforcement learning-like things. So the way we generate tasks is we have a grammar uh, that generates images. And these are blocks world images. Um, so here on the left side is a grammar, um, which, which basically you execute a sentence, you generate a sentence from this grammar, and that sentence produces an image. The kinds of images that you can generate are shown on the right-hand side. So these are basically blocks of towers, uh, sorry, towers of, with blocks, with uh, three different sizes of blocks, a large blocks, medium blocks, and small blocks, and probably hard to see that. Uh, and there's some rules, you know, about because implicit in the in the grammar are rules. You know, you can't put a, a large box on top of a small box and things of this sort. And the reinfo the listener agent will actually uh, do the blocks world construction task by dropping blocks in different columns and moving the sort of the gripper, if you like, uh, to different columns and dropping different blocks. So that's the task description. Um, so the target configuration will be shown to one agent and not shown to the other agent, which will just see the state of the world as, you know, as it's building the uh, blocks world problem, solving the blocks world problem, and it has to solve it. Okay, so here's an example of a sentence, of a tree, uh, from the probabilistic grammar that, that then generates a domain. This is the domain uh, that it generates, so this has two towers with, with uh, you know, a large blocks number one and two medium-sized boxes, uh, three and four, and then, uh, and, and, and so on. Okay, so we're gonna compare two agents, two agent architectures. First is a baseline, we'll consider a single agent setting, where the, that single agent gets both the target image and the current image, and then learns what actions to do, so that's the usual reinforcement learning single agent kind of uh, problem. Again, by the way, and this is a reinforcement learning problem, so it never gets rewards along, the, it, if, when we do it as a reinforcement learning problem, it won't get rewards along the way. It'll, it'll be uh, at the end. But I'm going to show you results for supervised learning and bandit setting as well. So the speaker-listener architecture for doing this uh, kind of task uh, also has a, gets the image, uh, the speaker part shown in blue and the listener part shown in red, gets the, uh, the, the, the blue part gets the target image, the red part gets the uh, current image, and then there is a um, kind of an LSTM based with uh, Gumbel softmax, this is fairly standard in this um, uh, language emergence kind of community, um, or tiny community. Um, and then it generates a sequence of symbols, basically, from a, from a set of symbols. And those set of symbols are generated through an LSTM um, uh, unfolding, and, the, and those are fed as input to the red box, to the red part of the neural net, which then has to learn how to um, generate that image. So hopefully that's clear. Do ask me questions if you if you don't uh, see it. So our experimental methodology will be is that we have a training testing boundary based on the number of blocks. So we might have, say, train on less than or, <clears throat> less than or equal to 15 blocks and evaluate uh, on, on greater than or equal to 15 blocks, let's say. Um, and so we'll, but we will also test, we'll do two t uh, generalization tests, interpolation and extrapolation. So for example, when we are training with less than or, less than or equal to, say, 15, we might never train on size 5 and size 10, which will be then interpolation. We, you know, we'll train on four and six and seven. And we'll never train above 15, and we'll, extrapolate, we'll do extrapolation testing as well. So I'm going to present results uh, for two learning methods, supervised learning, where we're literally training it by telling the listener agent, not the speaker agent, what to say, but the listener agent what, the, um, what it should do at any given point of time, given the target image. 
And then the bandit setting where we don't tell her what to do, but we give it a kind of a uh, immediate feedback if it, uh, depending on the action it does. You know, whether it's, it's the right action or not the right action. Just that kind of feedback. Okay, so we use uh, loss functions that in the supervised learning tell it exactly, essentially what to do. In the bandit setting, it has this combination of a bandit loss function and kind of an entropy-based loss function, so it's encouraged to explore. Okay, so let me show you the first set of results. Um, so the difference between these three different results is where the boundary of interpolation and extrapolation was. So 15 in the left-hand side, 20 in the middle, and 25 in the, um, in the rightmost size. And there are many different algorithms here, so I'm, it's a little bit of a busy plot, so I apologize for that. Um, the, look at the red curves for a minute. The red curves, actually, let's do the, uh, let's do the um, single agent ones, so the blue ones. So the dark blue um, is the single agent soup trained via supervised learning. And on the left of the boundary, we're showing you interpolation results. So we don't, so let's look at the middle block of 20, the middle graph. So we never train on size five, we never train on size 15, 10 and 15, and you're showing, we're seeing results on that left of the boundary of 20. And then of course we never train on 20, 21, 22, and you're seeing results, extrapolation results. So the first thing to observe is that the best performance in, when you train on, when the, in the middle graph, where you get nearly perfect extrapolation, is when we train with the banded version of the uh, training on the single agent setting. So that's the top light blue curve, which is nearly flat at 100%. Supervised learning does a little bit worse than the banded setting. I'll give you some intuition as to why. It doesn't extrapolate quite as well. And then, of course, we don't expect the speaker listeners to uh, extrapolate as well as the, uh, the single agent setting, uh, and it doesn't. Uh, and you can see that how the extrapolation falls off as you go to larger numbers of blocks. So the bottom line here is the bandits do better than supervised learning in both of these instances. The other thing to observe here is that the dash black line, the black dash curve, is the extrapolation it would get if it basically learned to produce the first 20, somehow what, some notion of first 20 correctly and then just failed at the rest. So if I give it an image with size 30, it just produced the right 20 and then it failed. That would be the dashed black curve. So you can see it does more than just the first 20, at least in terms of extrapolation. While well, single agent does much better, but even the speaker listener ones do better than the dashed black curve, at least just past the training boundary. And you can see there it gets, um, and in fact, if you train for larger numbers of blocks up to 25, the extrapolation for the speaker listener does even better. Okay. Um, this, by the way, the y, I didn't say the y axis. The x axis, I hope, was clear with the number of blocks in the image. The y axis was the, uh, a score given by the number of blocks it put down correctly before the first mistake. So if we did 80% of the blocks correctly before it made the first mistake, then it was a score of 0.8. Okay, this is uh, extrapolation when we only look at when it produced the exact when it produced the exact image and didn't give it any partial scores. I won't spend much time on this. So I want to give you some intuition about why bandits do better than supervised learning. The when we trained via supervised learning, uh, we had to choose an ordering in which it should put the blocks down because uh, you know we, we, we're telling it what to do. In bandits, it has the freedom to figure out in what order to produce the blocks. Essentially, the reinforcement learning problem is a set, or the action selection problem is a set selection problem, right? There are many different ways in which you can construct the image correctly. In supervised learning, we essentially pick one, right, a particular way of doing it. And so the task, in some ways, uh, the, the freedom that the bandit setting has to let it choose the ordering that generalizes best in some fashion allows for greater, greater generalization. So what I'm showing you on the left-hand side is the probability that the action uh, part of the, um, the listener produces for the, uh, the, the highest probability action. As you increase time within an episode on an image with 30 blocks. 
So in the speaker, it's nearly one. In other words, it has learned to produce a particular action. In the bandit, the highest probability action had a, when, in early on, when there's lots of different ways it could start the construction process, it's you know, roughly 0.3. So, the, so in other words, it has put probability mass on many different action choices that could have been the right one. Now, of course, you might think, well, maybe it has produced a low probability, but it's just because it learned to do the wrong thing. Quite the opposite, right? Because uh, as you can see, the, um, the speaker box, the banded version actually does better. And, and we're showing on the right-hand side the difference between picking actions stochastically based on the um, action probabilities versus greedily and that's the, the greedy one is the solid line and the dashed line is the, is the um, uh, probabilistically picking. So you can see that they put probability mass on, on good action choices. And that freedom is being exploited. One more slide and then I'm uh, trying to recover the time for the rest of the um, workshop. So here we looked at, um, so remember the speaker produces a, sim uh, a sentence with, with some number of symbols. And the listener gets that sentence and then has to produce the program. So what if we interfere with the sentence somehow, what the speaker says to the listener? So uh, probably hard to see, and I apologize for the size of the figures, but the first two of them, we uh, truncate the um, suffixes. And the different lines correspond to the performance drop, performance as we truncate suffixes, and the and the and the Two on the right uh, correspond to truncating prefixes. And again, you, the different ones correspond to different, different, size, different um, number of uh, symbols that are dropped. And the first and third correspond to supervised learning, and the second and fourth correspond to the bandit setting. So one sort of quick observation is, of course, uh, that suffixes it was more robust to dropping suffixes than to dropping prefixes, which kind of makes sense. Um, and the second one is that uh, the bandit is more robust than supervised learning to, to dropping these things. Uh, and actually, I, I'm going to stop here and, 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 and just say a few general words and then try to recover the, the missing time. So, you know, reinforcement learning, um, as you, and, and you've seen uh, other talks in the reinforcement learning space, uh, we, we, we induce um, options, programs that are uh, skills for, gen for, for creating tasks. Um, you heard a lot about compositionality and the need for compositionality, and of course, reinforcement learning is about compositionality at its heart. Um, at the same time, a, a number of us, including the previous speaker, um, are finding interesting to put structure of various sorts, to inject um, some kind of knowledge about compositionality into the um, learning systems, and you just saw a couple of instances of attempts to do that kind of stuff. With that, I'll stop and take questions if you have any. Thanks. See ya. somebody raise a hand. Is this on? Great. Thanks very much for the talk. I just had a question about the two architectures you had for sort of the single agent versus the double agent. Would you mind just elaborating a little bit on how you think about the difference between the two? Sort of because in my mind, the difference with communicating agents might be the bandwidth is much lower between the two agents versus, but there's still kind of one connected system you're training end to end. Yes. So how do you distinguish what's a single agent and what's multiple agents? Yes. Yes. Very good. So um, I, let me disconnect here so the next speaker can connect. Um, Yes, yeah, so um, we're actually doing work that I didn't talk about, where we literally don't have this end-to-end -end training between the listener and speaker. We're training them completely separately. And that I would really call the two-agent setting. So I, I would distinguish between the two as sort of a, base, a baseline architecture and a speaker-listener architecture. Um, the difference is the, as exactly as you said, the bandwidth. So the, the, the thing I was most interested in in the speaker-listener architecture is a form of the language that is um, used to communicate between a speaker and listener, which then induces the program, which then you know, creates the program on the listener side. And I didn't get a chance really to dive into some of the 
analysis we've done on the language that is, emerges uh, between the speaker and listener. And, and so yes, it's a particular um, symbolic uh, sequence kind of um, uh, communication between the two sides of the single agent architecture, if you like, versus the one where we have the more standard sort of neural net uh, layered architecture. So it's, it's, the, it's the constraint that we have put into this um, speaker-listener architecture and the analysis of the, of the language. The hope is that we get much better extrapolation. Uh, we, we, we can get better extrapolation by putting this kind of constraint in. We're still trying to achieve that, uh, achieve that result. So I hope that answered your question.